Welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. In this episode, I'm going to be talking and getting some information for you about stingray fishing. Now, stingrays, no doubt, are a sort of a dangerous species, but they're only dangerous if you mess around with them. And believe me, over the years, I've messed around with a lot of stingrays, some of them quite large. Now, wow, how can I put this? It's called a stingray because it has a sting, but it doesn't have a sting on the tip of its tail, you know, like a scorpion, where they can whip it over and sting it. It's not on the very tip of the tail. And a lot of people probably don't realize that the sting is in fact a barb. So the tail comes along here and it has a barb that sticks up. Now, I got one with a, in my collection of a, a, a tail and it shows you the barb. Now then, I had actually eaten stingray. I caught one that weighed it's on here, 34 pounds, back in 1985, on a press trip, I was doing a promotional fishing art from a photo journalist shoot in the Bahamas. Yes, much better than England, isn't it? And we ate this fish out of the yacht, just like a fish, really, to be honest. I haven't eaten another one since, but they are edible. I just want to show you about the sting, because I've got this tail here. Now, there you can see, hopefully, you can see the tail, and you would think the sting is right on the tip of the tail. There, like a scorpion, but it's not. It is in a very nasty appendage, I should say, just here. Look at the length of that. That is one, two, three, that's about four inches long. So that is something to be driving in your foot. And it is lethally sharp on the tip. Worse, it's covered in this sort of mucus poison stuff. And double worse, I know because I've been stung by one, it's not a sting, trust me, it's a bit more than a sting. This is serrated like a marlin bill, and they're all facing, you know, a different way. So it goes in, but when it comes out, that's quite a bit of damage. Now then, what I would suggest to you, to be honest, handling a stingray, is just keep away from the tail. Be aware that it doesn't just, the fish is laying flat like this, it does not just whip sideways, backwards and forwards, it whips vertically. I know, I've seen it, I've had one hit me. And they're a principal food, really, of bull sharks. The bull shark comes along, he'll go down on top of the stingray to kill the stingray and eat it. And a lot of bull sharks have been, uh, have been documented with stingray barbs snapped off underneath their chin. And why would a stingray drive it up? Because he knows the shark, the bull shark, is gonna come down on top of him. So there you go, be aware, take my advice, be very, very wary of that huge spiky barb. Some of them I've seen have two. There is no reason to chop the tail off as they do some long liners. Let the fish go. <laughs> if you wanted to, I suppose, you could get a pair of pliers, just snap, tweak that barb off, snap the tip off it, then it can't drive into anything, and they just regenerate. That's what I've been told. But be aware of it. There it is, a stingray. <laughs> Trust me, it ain't a barb. It's a lethal weapon. Be careful. Now, I know all about stingray barb because I've had one driven into the base of my foot. The story was this. I was over in the Florida Keys with the brother-in-law, who was a non-fisherman, and I was desperate to get him some fish. In a little rental boat, Florida Keys, Isla Mirada, great place to go fishing. I've done it dozens and dozens and dozens of times before, and I made the mistake of pulling up this stingray, I can't remember, 40, 50, 60 pound, what a monster, onto the bow of the boat, and normally I would drop it in the well of the boat, unhook it, be very careful with the stingray, the electrical sting of the barb, knew all about those, or thought I did, and as I stepped backwards, I tipped the boat up like this, and that slid Mr. Stingray on the deck, all the way over towards me, whipping and lashing with his tail, which I've seen many times before. Unfortunately, as I'm teetering backwards like this, it slammed the sting, the barb, right through my trainer, through my sock, two inches into just below the bone of my ankle, ripped it out, it was like hitting, being hit by a hammer, ripped it out, together with the meat, the inside of my foot, which came out through the sock and a piece of meat out through the trainer. It was not a pretty sight. I was knocked into the water, I tore all the bim bimini canopy off the, uh, off, the, off the little sunshade bit they have on those boats, went into the water, the boat's still slowly going in gear, and when I look up and cling on the side of the boat, my brother-in-law has got his foot on top on top of the stingray saying, it's okay Graham, I've got the fish, it's all right. Now, 
therein lies a little bit of information for you because we were nine miles out to sea. I had to drive the boat back with quite a considerable amount of pain, but that pain escalated. Here is the thing to listen for. If you should have the misfortune to get nailed by a stingray, do not put your foot or any other part of your body into a cold water situation, i.e. Gee, Graham, you need to put that in a bucket of ice, buddy. That looks pretty painful. I put my foot into a bucket of ice when I got back at the marina. It was excruciating. Tears in my eyes, I'm telling you. I had no choice. Apart from the fact some of the guys came along and said, pour some beer on it, that'll cure it. And the other one I had was, I know just what to do there, man. Piss on it. No, I don't think so. Nobody is pissing on my foot. Anyway, it was in fact true, because one of the guys phoned back to a hospital, did an international call for me, very, very helpful guy, and the poisons unit in London said, do not, under any circumstances, get it cold. I've got my foot in a bucket of ice. Apparently it does something like, concentrates the, the proteins or something in the poison and makes it worse. And then when I got back to my motel room, I emptied one of the waste bins, filled it with hot water, put my foot in it, and the pain dissipated within, let me tell you, 30 seconds. After that, it was an extremely expensive visit to the Mariners Hospital, on one of the other keys, and after that is history. But I still get cramp in that foot, I can't use my snorkel and flipples, and that's 30 years later. There's a little hint there, so warm water, not cold water, should you get nailed by a stingray. Now then, that shows you a little bit, or tells you a little bit, about the stingray. Beware, take care. They are very strong fighting fish. They live on the bottom, and I used to catch them on chunks of bait, everything, everything. They will eat pretty much worms, everything. Now, the other thing is over here in the UK, we do in fact get stingrays. Very, very few places that you can catch them. They do get them on the south coast of England, let's say the months of June, July, August, maybe September, when the water is at its warmest. And they like to come up onto the mud flat areas. Not many people have caught them in the UK, in the British Isles, from the shore. Not many. It's quite a rarity. It's actually a sort of specialist fishing subject, I suppose you could say. And you get dedicated followers that just try and catch stingrays. Some of these are big. Some of them go 30, 40, 50, 60 pounds. Possibly, I would say, one of the biggest fish you're ever going to catch in the UK off the shore. Anyway, I went down to the south coast, met some guys who were dedicated stingray shore enthusiasts and I wanted some information from them. I'm hoping it will help you guys should you want to catch any stingray from the shore. Tips are in there, totally awesome tips. Just listen, learn. I certainly learn something on looking for the ground that these guys specialise on looking at. There's a lot of interesting information in there for you. Hopefully it might put your rod bending into a big British stingray. Let's hear what they had to say. Well guys, I've stopped down here. I've never been down here before. Beautiful setting, bottom end of the New Forest. I'm looking across at the Isle of Wight. The lads are already away down the beach, walking down there, because they've got about an hour before low water they want to fish, and they tell me the stingrays can come at any time, any state of the tide. It's muggy, the wind has dropped from the last two days, a horrendous wind I've had. It looks pretty good at the moment. They've got so much bait. I mean, if we don't catch something, I'll make them eat it. I'll make them eat their bait. So they're down there rigging up. We're going to go down. So we've got Adam, Steve, Craig. Hopefully, I might even get a rod out myself. But the idea is to get the information. Let's get down there and see how they're going to rig up on what bait they're going to be using for these stingrays. held back to do some distance shots, I zoomed in, what on earth were those guys wandering around in low water looking for? They were absolutely trying to spot something there. And look at that channel coming, that's what I call a finger channel. To me, even though I've never fished a beach before, that would be a place that any fish might travel up to, but be aware you could get cut off. And look here, 
they're obviously extremely interested in looking at the ground before they even start to get their fishing rods ready. Um, over the low tide, obviously while we're stinger fishing, and come down to the low water mark and find the stinger imprints. As you can see quite clearly there, very triangular, deep shape. I'm not sure if they, they come up in here looking for food or whether they're just sunbathing or what, but you can see by the depth of that fish, here's his wingspan. He'd be that deep in the body. He'd be guessing would you, around would, the 15. Would they, be, would they be like sucking food out of the bottom and that, yeah, that's created that depression, you reckon? I can only imagine so. Yeah, you can see where, the, where they've built the shingle up on the edge, obviously, where he's been moving his wings yes. and digging. I, I guess they're looking for a worm or, you know, or a small crab. Trying to dig something out the bottom and that's what creates that depression there. Yeah, that's what creates the depression. You, know, it's quite, you can see there's been quite a few of them in here. There's a lot of activity been going on here over the low, over the high tide. I so you, you think that might be over the last tide or it could be... I think that, that's quite an old one, that one. Yeah, there's, yeah. Well, there's bits of weed and stuff in it now. That'd be a, a couple of weeks ago. So if it's clean but, with no weed in it and a lot... Then it's the last tide. It'd yeah, be the it's last good, tide. You can see the shingles very disturbed on a fresh one. You can see. You know. And, and food-wise, what sort of other food would they have in here? Crabs and stuff? Yeah, crabs, shrimps, any little worm, you know, white rag, normal rag. There's quite a lot of lugworm around here as well. I, I, I reckon they probably feed on a lot of blow lug. Myself, the stingray, Steve. You can see he's been here as well. He's had a little move across looking for, for whatever he was searching for. And do you get this on other beaches on the Solent area? Yeah, or is it pretty pretty much the, all of them? The, the entire length of the Solent, pretty much. Right, right from... Sort of the, you can see the marshland over there, anywhere from the marsh, right back to Leap Beach, you see yeah. these imprints everywhere. There's some quite substantial ones sometimes. You see one and it's, it's huge. You it's big, it's, it's scary. Fish. <laughs> it's scary. That's the one you want, you know. <laughs> one thing the stingers might be looking for when they're on the feed is cuttlefish eggs. And as you can see, a lovely big bunch of cuttle eggs there. There's a lot of cuttle in the Solent. There should be a lot of these eggs around, one thing they might be feeding on. I'm not sure if they do, but I definitely know they eat cuttlefish. So I can imagine that'd be quite a tasty little snack for them to eat. Yeah, one, one thing, this time of the year is the only time of the year you will find these cuttle eggs. There's a, a line of pots you can see out there quite clearly. There's a lot of commercial boats, they target the cuttle rounder this time of the year. You have a massive glut of them for ages and ages, sort of, I guess a month or so of dying cuttle along the surface. and. Um, Quite often you can see big bass and stuff hitting the dead cuttle on the surface that are floating. And um, yeah, it's a very good bait this time of the year. And you see, you find a lot of those. Very peculiar, they look like a bunch of grapes. They taste but, yeah. nice as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not bad on toast. <laughs> can we get you eating them on camera? <laughs> no, <laughs> <Doubtful. all good>. <laughs> <No>. <laughs>
and just watch how Steve, when I zoom in, actually in mid-flight of lead, I think backs off that drag on the wheel of the damper. I see him twist it, I've never seen that done in mid-flight before. The guys are first class anglers, check out what they have to say. Just speaking a little bit about tackle wise, what we use, stuff like that. Um, my chosen setup for stingray fishing and just general fishing really, on fishing the rocks and Bristol Channel, places like that. Um, I like to use a pair of Excalibur Sea Curves, Century Excalibur Sea Curves. Um, reels, I use Shimano Trinidad 14s. Um, very nice bit of kit, very smooth, lovely for casting, so the rod's beautiful. Um, Line wise, I like to use carp line, believe it or not, from the beach. I use ESP Crystal in 18 pound, very strong, very abrasion resistant, and awesome for casting. Um, the way I fish my rods, I fish them in the low position, reels right down the butt of the rod, tournament style. Um, obviously, with the producer, they you know, get a little bit more length to them. They handle just about everything, really. They, I've had blondes to over 20 from the shore, I've had eels to 30, you know, stingers to mid 20. They, they handle it all, we tied everything. Brilliant piece of kit. Recommend it to anyone. Hi, my name's Craig. I'm just going to talk to you uh, roughly about how to get a good ragworm bait on um, for stingrays. Generally, they like a you know a big a big ray bait, a big uh, worm bait, lots and lots of worms, sort of maybe even four, five, six at a time. Um, we've got some good ragworms here, uh, locally dug by Steve Perry. Good healthy worms, lively little buggers. Um, yeah, so you know the stingrays they like big baits. So what I generally like to do is get a couple of big ones on first of all, put them on properly, throw them up the line, and they don't bite you. Like so. Then the same again. And juicy. Uh, with, this, with a couple, I like to just put them on sort of half mast, so through his mouth, um, sort of halfway up the body, and then put it out and up the shank. Same again, halfway, so in through the top of him, like so. Um, and leave that hanging. Then we stick one more on, not such a big one, just to tip it off nicely. Go through his mouth, all the way down. Thread him up. And there he is. Now, give it a good pull down, make sure they're reaching the bottom with the hook. Using the top panel hook, make sure it's all pulled down nicely. Couple of turns through his body. That there is a lovely stingray bait. Bit of attraction in the water with the hanging worms. Nice and compact, nice and appealing. Yeah, good bait. Let's hope he gets a fish. <laughs>
Okay, so following that uh, big old stingray bait, um, low tide, me and the guys, we went out, we had a walk around in the mud, and we noticed that there was a lot of rutting seats where the uh, stingrays have actually been sat uh, rutting around. Um, so that was only 30, 40 yards out, so just gonna plop this one out and see what happens. As the time ticks on, things come and go in life. Uh, so Jen, uh, usually uh, stingray fishing, I like to take one fixable uh, rod and reel, also a multiplier. Um, fixed ball uh, rods had that had that baby there that Alicon leader had that since I first started it's been my luckiest rod had many big fish on that um, great rod nice and strong in the wind and you can it's very sensitive you can see the bites really well um, the reel I use is the Penn Surf Blaster 6000 great little reel um, line to the max with 30 pound braid on flies nicely all weathers really really good setup really comfortable no issues with it good stuff um, my second rod is the uh, Daiwa Supercast. It's a bit of an old rod, but um, a very, very good rod. Uh, nice and strong once again in the wind. Very sensitive. Uh, Casts really, really well. Got lots of play in it. Get lots of purge. Really good rod. Um, the reel have actually just stepped up. I uh, usually use the Millionaire. Um, foolproof, foolproof multiplier. Really swear by them. Got four of them. Um, but I've just bought the Blue Yonder, the Abu. Find it a really nice, really nice reel. Uh, it's got a really good ratchet on it. Um, casts really well. Um, never get any problems with it. I think I've only ever birdied it once. Um, but yeah, a great setup. I advise any any young fisherman um, to stick with a fixed ball as well as a multiplier whilst learning to use a multiplier because that's what I've done. But I've actually stuck with that. Um, it's a good method. Yeah, on the multiplier, um, that's lined with 15 pound fire line um, with a 50 pound chalk leader. Uh, very good stuff. Um, Nice and strong, got a bit of play in it. Um, like I say, never, never really had any birdies with it, no, never any problems. And just look at underwater here. It's so clear I could use the underwater camera, which in the sort of Isle of Wight and Solent area must be a rarity indeed to be able to see the seabed two inches in front of you but this is the ground that those stingrays are coming in and feeding over. As you can see, plenty of weed, plenty of mud, plenty of stones. It's a great place, it obviously gets some very big fish and even this guy is anchored out there kayak fishing and I reckon, do you know what, he's fishing for stingrays as well. couldn't get over this weird sort of mud effect that that top of the shoreline has. It looked right peculiar to me. Didn't bother the other guys, they knew it well. But once you got over that, it, it, it just ran down into a regular sort of flat, shallow area. And I can well see that that's the sort of place a stingray would be. Now, the wind was up and down like a yo-yo, and you can see that shallow water stirred up by the wind and the tide action, and we get pushed further and further up the beach. A few hints and tips on stingray fishing. Uh, I've been fishing the Solent beaches for a fair few years. I've had a fair few stingray, uh, up to 50 pounds, um, only a fortnight ago. I had a good fish, approximately 50 pounds. Um, one good tip is that obviously a 50 pound fish uh, will take line off your reel. So make sure you do have your drag backed off so the fish can take line when it wants to. And be patient with the fish. Most of the Solent beaches are relatively snag free, so you've got plenty of time. And when you are at the process of beaching the fish, make sure you have plenty of distance between you and the water's edge. Keep as much line between you and the fish so they stretch, so it acts like a shock absorber. And then once you've actually beached the fish, then ask for assistance from your fellow anglers. One other thing you don't want to do you don't want to lower your, your rod tip down and point it at the fish. You 
you've got to use your rod as a shock absorber. Keep the rod tip high and that will absorb the lunges from any big stingrays that you do land from the shore. The one thing with the stingray is there's no need for gaffs, uh, for gaffing fish. You can quite easily beach the fish in the surf and then either pull it out on the hook snood or the leader or grab it by the cheek of the wing and pull it on out until it's on dry land and then you can deal with it safely. Yeah, so uh, stingray fishing in the Solon. Um, a lot of people seem to think um, nighttime fishing is the only time you're going to get a stingray. Personally, from what I've encountered in my experience and what I've seen, daytime is by far the better time for stingrays. Um, generally, you want a nice hot, sunny day, the water to be nice and clear, um, not much action on it. Uh, they tend to like coming in to sit on the warm mud uh, and stuff like that. Um, also, tide-wise, I would say the smaller the tide, the better. Um, don't ask me why, just that's how it seems to be here in the Solin. Uh, but yeah, generally, I would always say if you're going to go after a stingray in the Solin, definitely go in the daytime. In regards to tides again, um, you, you tend to get them on low tide. Um, if, you, if you don't have them on low tide, don't be afraid to put the hours in because Obviously, if you last it out, they like to come in on the high tides as well. So I know that can be a long session, but if you've had no joy on the low tide, which is the preferred time for them, last it out, keep, keep plugging away, keep getting your baits out there um, and see what happens on a high tide. Um, you, you might find you'll be lucky. Stingrays, uh, they generally come in around uh, June, sort of early June. Um, you'll find them popping up. Um, a lot of people seem to think they're only in for you know, a short period of time. Generally, they're in right to the end of September. Um, so, you know, if if you if you're really after a stingray, you've got plenty of time. Keep getting out there. Keep getting your baits out. You know, you've got a good few months period to get out there and get yourself a stingray. So, yeah, put the hours in. Well, fishing for stingrays. Obviously, you saw earlier when I set the bait up. Um, if you're going to need a lot of worm, um, you want six, seven a time. So, if you're going for a 10-hour sesh, which is a long sesh. You're going to want, between one man, you're going to want five, six pound of worm. I know that's a lot, it seems a bit excessive, but that's what you need. Um, don't be shy with it, especially in the daytime, because if the crabs are out, they're going to be hounding your, your, your baits every 10, 15 minutes. So check your baits every 15 minutes, because the crabs really are a pest. Um, you know, they tend to drop out at night, which is a good thing. Um, so yeah, but you, you, you can't be shy on bait. You need plenty of ragworm, that, that's a dead cert. Um, fa failing catching a stingray, you're putting big worm baits out. Um, they're generally around the same time as, as the smoothies are about. You, you know, you get your big ins. Um, they will, they will happily take a big bunch of worm on the end of a line. It doesn't have to be all crabs. You don't need to go spending a pound of time on a crab. Get your big worm baits out there. Not to say if you don't catch a stingray, you've got a very good chance of catching a big smooth hound, which can be a lot of fun, as we all know. It seemed a bit weird to me that you've got all this fabulous new forest area going right down to a beach. And although they've got wonderful flowers and that there, they've also got, what, horses, wild horses walking along the beach at low tide? No, not just one. These are new forest wild horses. They come out of the forest for some reason, just walk along at low tide. Nobody seemed phased by it at all. And this guy's thinking, hang on, what base are they using over there on the beach? Peeler crab? You can see the look on his face. That horse wants to fish. Can somebody please give him a rod? How close does the new forest come to the beach? Absolutely, right up to the edge of it.
do a little bit of talking about Stingray welfare and you know my experiences with them, stuff like that. I've you know, done a lot of fishing for stingrays over the past like, four or five years, and one thing I have learned you definitely need is a hand rag, a good, thick, strong hand rag. As you can see, I you can see that very well, picking it up very well. There's a lot of black slime on there, the mucus from their tail, from their sting. I suggest if you haven't fished for them before, make sure you have a hand rag and be very, very cautious with the fish. They're extremely dangerous, as a few people have found out with being stung. Luckily, I haven't been tagged yet and I've had, I don't know, best part of 50 stingray, I guess, something like that, through the solar. Nothing massive, up to about 25 pounds. But when you get them, bring them up on the beach, they have a, a little manic five minutes where they'll go crazy and they they stab themselves sometimes quite often because they're, they're very aggressive fish. Just pin their tail down, nice and gently with your foot, just make sure it's nice and firm on their foot. Get your hand rag, wrap it round it. Some people use electrical tape, I don't, I just hold onto the tail very tightly, just stop it from moving. Once you've got hold of the, the tail, then your friend or whoever's fishing with you can just get the hook out, no problem at all. Once the hook's removed, then you can handle the fish a bit more. One more thing I'd like to pick up on is do not cut the tail off. You quite often catch a fish, like a commercial angler has caught it in their net and they've locked the whole tail off with a machete or a sharp knife. Do not do that, there's no need to do it. It's the fish's defence at the end of the day. It's what they use to defend themselves if, if a predator is trying to eat them. Um, if you get a deep hooked fish, do not try and cut the hook out with a knife or get a T-bar down its throat and try and pull it out. That doesn't do the fish any good either. They're very hardy fish stingray, right? but just cut the line, make sure you've got a hook that rusts away, not a stainless hook, and they'll be absolutely fine. They'll live happily with that. For my ray fishing, uh, I use a pair of uh, leader Icon M Sport power rods, um, nice rods they are for the job, got plenty of grunt in them, a uh, pair of Penn 525 mag reels, um, they're matched up with 16 pound main line, um, 16 pounds quite ample here I think, a lot of open water, no snags so you can have a good bit of fun um, when you hook a good fish, um, yeah good rods and reels for the, uh, for the job, that's what I use all the time. This is one of the rigs we like to use for the Stingray down here on the south coast. As you can see, it's got a 5 ounce impact lead. The main body is made out of 60 pound grease weasel with a swivel and clip there to attach to the main line, which runs down on two running beads and on a weight holder, down to another swivel, which is 80 pound test. And then we have a four foot hook snood 40 pound amnesia leading down to a strong forged 3-0 hook with a 2-0 retainer. The beauty of this particular rig is called an up and over. Once baited up we can attach this to the impact lead like so. And then on the top here, we have a little clip that we can clip onto, which brings it all streamlined, makes it very aerodynamic for casting. And of course, once it releases, once it hits the water and comes off the top, you have a nice long flowing trace, which is very enticing for the rays, so they don't feel the, uh, the lead once they settle on the bait. Here's Steve Perry doing a slow motion inshore cast. He wants to just lob it out there and reach that deep water gully where he'd seen those sort of beds where the stingrays at low tide had dug it all out. And that's what they're looking for. They're absolutely targeting the main area where they think those fish are gonna come in. Concentrated fishing. So I hope you got a few tips there. I hope it's given you inspiration to get out there and at least try to catch a stingray. Look, these guys are full on hardcore fishing specialists. They're long distance casters. 
they get great bait from Steve Perry and they're out there putting the time on in a weird environment. This looks like the Grand Canyon to me. It's all like soft mud, holes in it as well. And do you know what? I can't wait to get back there fishing again. Who knows what's swimming around in these waters.